Well, you can't have a small town without a little bit of mural art somewhere in it. And Dasso, Minnesota, which is where we're at, is no different. It's pretty cool, and I think out of all of them, this one is my favorite picture right here. It's got the, the lake over there on, on the right. Camping scene, wilderness, and of course the church with the cow in front of it. <laughs> Classic Minnesota. Well done, whoever put this together. Well done. And behind me right there in that building is the Dassel Area Historical Society. It is our first stop today of two stops. This one, we're going to learn a little bit about the Dassel area and its history, apparently, according to the name on the museum. And so that should be interesting. And then the next stop, if you're a fan of twine, and specifically large balls of twine, you're going to want to stick around until the very end for this one. So there's going to be a lot of interesting things. Welcome to another edition of Tommy Travels. It's Tommy Travels. And before we get into this adventure, I want to give a shout out to a early supporter named Canute, who is a subscriber and was the first person to give me a donation, a little bit of gas money he gave me yesterday to help me along my journeys. And that represents the very first incoming money from starting this channel. And uh, I don't have enough subscribers or anything yet to start uh, doing anything like monetizing the channel or anything like that and so uh, he was nice enough to just drop in a little donation so Canute thank you so much for your support definitely appreciate it and now uh, this should be a great adventure so come on with me let's go see what there is to see So there are four levels to this museum. We are on the first level right now, and our tour starts today, right here. And you see those little brown things that are kind of sticking up there from the spry? And down in here, that is called ergot, E-R-G-O-T, ergot. And ergot is not a good thing to see on rye or wheat or anything like that because if, if this fungus um, forms inside of the kernel's husk, it replaces the grain and it infests a whole crop. And once it's ground down and made into breads and ingested, it can cause convulsions wild hallucinations and even it can cause a constriction of blood vessels very dangerous and it goes way back archaeologists have translated the cuneiform figures on this tablet revealing a prayer asking the gods for protection from ergot it's one of the earliest documents expressing the fear of ergot and these hallucinations have happened throughout the years. It's caused more deaths, they think, than all of the plagues combined. Pretty amazing. Now, rich people could afford white bread, but a lot of the poor people could not. So they ingested the grains infected with ergot, and they believed that ergot was a main factor in this right here and what we're looking at in this painting is the Salem witch trials they think that the odd behaviors were a result of the ergot and caused a lot of people to act pretty funny and brought on the Salem witch trials 
until one day this man right here, Eli Lilly, he was a 1900s chemist that began identifying medically useful alkaloids found in ergot. And so he started telling the farmers, hey, don't burn your fields if they're infested with ergot. Send, a, send the um, harvest to me and we'll take, it, take out all of the ergot and then process that field without ergot inside of it. And they use the ergot as medicines to cure a lot of disease. So that air got would come here to this building and these women right here would take out those tiny little things from the grains so that they could use them for the medicine. And if it wasn't for air got, these women in this small town of Dassel may not have had any work opportunities at all. And this lady right here is still alive, well into her 90s today, this one right here. And the money that she made from working here in this building provided her enough money to go to nursing school, where she made quite a good living as a nurse. She moved to California, she had a great life and a lot of opportunities afforded to her by this very small town of Dasso right here, and this opportunity provided by the magical powers of Ergot. During World War II, many battlefield deaths from hemorrhaging were prevented by drugs made from Ergot. The primary source for making those drugs was the Ergot collected in this building. And because Ergot was found in pharmaceuticals, we find ourselves right here inside of the Peterson Pharmacy. Old time pharmacy drugstore set up here with empty gelatin capsules right there. The mortar and pestle. The old time phone. Love that. Hello, sir. You must be Mr. Peterson, I would presume. You have quite a nice little pharmacy going on here, and I really like your classic 7-Up cooler. And of course, have got the ice cream sundaes. <laughs> Set up for a romantic little outing for two. <laughs> Looks like that ice cream has been sitting there for quite a while. And so we find ourselves on the second level of this museum right here and we find ourselves looking at some clipper mills. The female employees worked on a series of clipper mills like these on this level of the building just separating the ergot from the rye. And there's a picture of a lady doing just that. And here is a replica model of the building we are in right now. I like how they've got this little uh, office set up right here. That's pretty cool. This is where we entered in, right here at the entrance. And then this is where the ladies work to separate the air got. And then all the machinery to make it happen. And these, as the sign says, are two locally built machines to expedite the processing of ergot. Both proved to be unsuccessful, but they remain as examples of the ingenuity needed to carry on the innovative work done at Dassel's Universal Laboratories. So this is the third floor of the museum, and this third floor doesn't have much to do with air god anymore. It is all about corn. I did not know this about Dassel, but it is the hub of hybrid seed corn. Because back in the 30s, 1930s, you could grow corn in Iowa and 
Nebraska, Missouri, that was considered great corn growing country. But north of that in Minnesota, Wisconsin, the Dakotas, Montana, it was considered too cold and not suitable for corn growing. However, there was a lot of good land up here and farmers wanted to grow corn. And so they went to hybrid seed corn. They had to develop corn with strong root systems that would grow larger ears of corn with bigger kernels and that would sustain the shorter growing season. And that's where Dassel came in. Dassel Seed Corn Companies produced several varieties of hybrid seed, making this small community a bustling mecca for the seed corn industry. And here is a receipt from a purchase of seed corn from Auburn Dominant Sons. Quality always, Dassel, Minnesota, one bushel. And just standing here, it just, it's kind of weird because when I woke up this morning, I had no idea what Dassel, Minnesota was all about. And <laughs> two industries affected by this small little town. One we just learned about and now corn. It's weird to think that when you see a cornfield in Minnesota or Wisconsin, North and South Dakota, a lot of the reason for that started right here in this little small town, developing hybrid seed to grow said corn. And the fourth floor of this museum has nothing at all to do with seeds of any kind. What we're looking at right here is a fiberglass mold of a Tiffany lamp. And you can see, it's kind of hard to see on the camera, but you can see the little drawings on there that make up the artwork that go on to the lamp. And each individual piece of glass is shaped into each said pattern that you can see right there. I'll zoom in a little bit on it here so you can see. Each piece is soldered into every little shape there to make up the art that goes into a Tiffany lamp. And Dassel happens to have local artists that are very good at making replicas of Tiffany lamps, like this one right here, titled Water Lily. They've got all sorts of different kinds of lamps here. Probably the most unique of them all is this one right here, a Nautilus lamp, done by Ray Lolane. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but Ray, that is some excellent work. And I like the color. I love the aqua blues. And they've got this bamboo themed lamp. You can see with the browns and the green leaves. The only thing missing is a panda bear. And they even have a dragonfly lamp. So if you're a fan of dragonflies, this is definitely the lamp for you. Well, it's hard to pick a favorite one of these, but I think this one wins the award. Not just because it's a beautiful lamp, it's got the added decoration of this lovely little peacock right here. <laughs> Strutting her stuff. And as an added bonus, right off the main drag here, which is why there's a lot of highway noise, is this little find right here. A mushroom house, old style mobile gas station. Look at that pump. This is also in Dassel, and it is a gathering place for the town every Wednesday night. They'll have little local festivities that carry on here, like little town dances. They've got picnic tables over here, as well as a little gazebo. 
and you can tell there's a lot of good times to be had right here in Dassel. So in my younger days, I used to perform stand-up comedy throughout the Twin Cities. And this little gazebo area back here makes me think that if I were still doing that, this would be a good place to set up an open stage. On a beautiful day like this, with picnic tables all around, we could entertain, well, a few people, not quite the masses, but some people. And the second part of our journey today brings us to the beautiful small town of Darwin, Minnesota. And that is probably the most interesting water tower in the state because if you look at the base, right here is this little building. And inside of that gazebo is the largest ball of twine in Minnesota. There is a sign that calls it the world's largest ball of twine, but I don't believe that is true anymore in this day and age. But it is definitely the largest one in Minnesota. And so we're going to check it out. And if you're wondering exactly where the Twine Ball Museum is located, and where our present location is, it's right here. <laughs> On Twine Ball Lane. Of course. Now the only problem with this ball of twine being in a gazebo like this is being able to actually see it with a reflection. So it is kind of difficult to see. But here is a picture of the person who made it. His name is Francis Johnson. That is him with his ball of twine. It is nearly 40 feet in circumference. 11 feet high. And the diameter is 12 feet 9 inches. And this ball of twine weighs approximately 11 tons. And it all started back in March of 1950 when he won the first piece of the ball of twine around his two fingers. And then he didn't stop winding this ball of twine until 1979. And in 1991, this was recognized in Guinness Book of World Records as the world's largest ball of twine. And there it is. Pretty massive accomplishment. You can almost see the ball of twine a little bit better from a little further distance. Standing in the shade. As you can kind of tell, this is a pretty decent sized gazebo. And this ball of twine takes up almost every square inch of the inside. In fact, it looks like that door, if you opened it all the way up, would bump right in to that huge ball of twine. <laughs> and adjacent to the largest ball of twine is this cute little museum right here where you can get some more twine ball info and souvenirs. So let's go take a look. Hey, you know how I can tell that I'm in a small town? Because if interested in purchasing souvenirs and seeing the museum, please call Chris <laughs> and see if he is available. Have a nice day. So I guess we're not going to get inside here today, but I'm sure that gives you a good reason to come down and see what else there is in this museum and learn some more history. And if you do come here to the Twine Museum, make sure that you check out this mailbox and open it up to sign the guest book. There you go, largest ball of twine museum. Consider it signed. That water tower goes up a long way. That is for sure. And then right underneath, they've got this pretty little garden area. With some flowers and plants for your viewing pleasure.
Very pretty area up here, that is for sure. And right here at the same location as the largest ball of twine is this bell tower for Independent School District 42. And there's the actual bell that hung on the building. It was a two-room schoolhouse built in 1911 that looked just like that. And Miss Mary McCrath and Miss Stella Jones were teachers in this building. It was uh, taken down in 1983 and then donated to the community in 1991 and the bell was preserved by the mayor, Neil Johnson. I think I finally found a good angle to get a decent shot of the ball of twine without getting a reflection of everything around you here. And so this is the gazebo and there is the ball of twine in all of its glory. Well this has been an absolute blast hanging out with you guys today in Dassel and in Darwin with the largest ball of twine. Uh, lots of history around this area that I had no idea about. And so it's always fun to learn a little something as well. And so if you guys enjoyed what you saw here today, go ahead and hit like on the YouTube channel. And then please go ahead and hit subscribe and the little bell notification next to it. And then also you can follow me at Tommy Travels as well. TommyTravels.fun that is. And there's links to my Facebook and Instagram and even my current and previous video and my show theme. So lots of ways to get a hold of me. You guys, thanks once again for coming along for the ride. And I hope to catch you on the flip side.